Uh, this week's Old Sword Club weekly lesson. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Tim. I am the instructor type person here at the Old Sword Club and um, convener and like a bunch of other things. Um, anyway, but the point is I'm, I'm running the lesson tonight, which you know, is, is the thing that I, I also do in person when we're not in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> um, so yeah, so and we're, oh, and actually fun fact, we're going to be meeting up in person in a couple of weeks. Uh, actually, not this Saturday, but the Saturday after, I believe. So like a week and a bit. But point is, if you want to come up the Blue Mountains of Australia, <laughs> you, you can meet up with us in person and uh, like do sorty stuff, which is going to be awesome fun. Uh, so anyway, today we're looking at um, auxiliary parries, or the most common auxiliary parries, because there's a lot of parries in 19th century British sword fighting, but these are the ones that are the most common that you see them um, across a few manuals, uh, but also they are not common enough to be like the core parries of 19th century British cutlass and sabre. Um, probably the reason why these parries are the ones you see the most outside of, um, you know, you sort of, you call, you know, Cartier's, um, Septim, Second parries, is that um, they come from foil fencing. So we're looking at like Prime, Second, uh, Quint, which is a bit of a weird one, uh, the Head Guard, which doesn't come from, is the one that doesn't come from uh, foil fencing, um, and also um, Octave. Um, I might also touch again on Septim just because it does have some other applications than just defending the leg, uh, which I guess is the thing about the auxiliary parries is a number of them are a parry that is commonly used for a specific purpose but has other applications. Um, so yeah, that, that's going to be kind of cool. Um, the reason I'm, I think it's important to know multiple parries as well is when I'm fencing someone, if they respond the same way two or three times, I'm going to assume that they'll respond that way at least one more time and that gives me a lot of information, even if it's not enough to like faint and defeat their parry, it is enough to know, okay, well, I can set, if they react this way, I can set up this kind of repost. Whereas if a person can parry with multiple different parries and actually varies their defense, they're a lot less predictable and a lot harder to deal with. So having multiple parries for the same line is quite useful. So hey, let's start off. Uh, so I'm gonna grab my trusty sword and just to cover something that I have covered in previous weeks, but I'm also, I'm also aware that we might have a few new people coming in. Uh, let's look at the guard we use, which is the medium guard. So, for me, we one with our chair out of shot. And two, what I want you to do is just come, is just form an L with your feet um, on the ground, sorry, turn it from the side. I have pretty much a straight line between my back heel, my sword side heel, my sword side toes. Um, and if you've got like floorboards or like nails or like any kind of straight line on the ground, you actually can stand on that line to get a sense of um, where, you know, where your feet should be placed. Um, from here, I want to step so my feet are about two foot widths apart. Um, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. I don't want to bend my knees, so I'm in a nice, comfortable spot. Um, and basically, you know you've bent your knees enough if you can move without your head bobbing, or at least, or with your head saying, most of them, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, I was always told when I was doing you know, more traditional forms of martial art that you should move without your head moving up and down. But no one told me why, and the reason is it's actually a good measure of whether or not you've bent your knees enough to make you move, um, <coughs> to allow for precise movement. Because if I'm standing bolt upright, to move, I have to bend my knees, move, and then if I'm standing bolt upright, I'll probably come back up to bolt upright, at which point, you know, I've basically had two redundant movements in my step. Or the other thing I might do is step, is make a pendulum step to move by, move my entire body, which, yeah, I mean, this is goofy as fucking shit. Um, and also has a lot less control, um, of, ruins a lot of my control of movement and also ruins a lot of um, my attacks because now everything's a lot more committed and a lot bigger and more predictable. You can sort of see the difference. If I'm doing this, I'm happy, you can 
see me move. Whereas, as I'm doing this, the point where you see me coming forward is a little bit lighter, so it's a nice fine movement to give me a bit of advantage. So, yeah, so you want to bend your knees enough that when you step, your head doesn't bob up and down. Um, from here, I'm going to get my sword, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to take my back arm, bend it to 90 degrees, and put it on my hip and fist. Pow! And I'm going to take my front arm, I'm going to bend it at 90 degrees, I'm going to sit my elbow, so it's an elbow probably fist width, um, you know, like, what's that, like, a couple of centimeters, inch or two, I don't know, I'm just going with fifth, I wish to my fifth, fist width, um, in front of my ribs. I'm going to have my forearm basically horizontal, and my tip is going to be my sword tip. Which is not showing up very well on the camera, so I might actually switch to something slightly more visible, just make your lives a little bit easier. Go across a single stick. My uh, sword tip is going to be about the height of my shoulder. So I can see myself in the video. A uh, really, really useful thing to do if you've got like big, um, big windows or a nice full mirror or something is actually come and guard and look at yourself in the mirror from different angles um, to see where everything is and adjust it and try and feel what it feels like. But yeah, the reason I want my tip about shoulder height is I need my sword ready for action. And if it's shoulder height, it means all I need to do thrust and steps on the face is straighten my arm. Um, my tip is already aligned, so you know, if I'm up like this, if I need to stab someone in the face, throw my tip down and then stab them. Um, which means, you know, which one is a slow movement, but two actually is one of my intent. But I also want my tip high enough that if I, you know, the if I need to quickly chop someone in the arm, it's hard to do that. So if I have my tips flat like this, and I want to chop someone in the arm, I'm going to have to bring it up first, which is a much more visible movement. If it's just up here, it just cracks straight down. Um, and so this is my medium guard. Uh, I'll show you from the front. The sword is based in your arm. If you remember that line between your back heel, your front heel, and front toes, you should be sitting right above it. Um, this is the medium guard. Um, and it's, the guard sits right on the centre line of the fight. So, if you imagine, basically, a line that you know extends from my shoulder, um, you know, horizontally forward, let, um, right above that, you know, right above the line of you know, the line made by you know my heels and toes. That's the centre line of the fight, um, and being able to judge that is quite useful. Act. Right. So let's start by looking. at I'm just going to switch weapons again because as much as I do love the music, it's not quite as comfortable as my offer cuts. So, from a bigger yard, we're going to look at our, our the first parry, which is our prime parry. So, the prime is this hand position. Right, my hand is basically in this plane, but held on um, the off side of my body. So, just a different terminology. The side that my sword is on, so in this case my right side, is my sword side. The side that my sword is not on is my off side. So, prime, my prime parry is my hand held, and the, you know, is held thumb down, palm pointing to my sword side. Um, but sitting in line with, but sitting so that my sword is on my, so my sword is covering my offside, or my offside, just near the opposite side of my sword. And so to form that parry, all I do, and then guard, is I draw a little circle. I'm actually, I certainly tip away from the side I'm going to parry on, because I find doing that prompts me to keep my sword basically in front of me and covering me the whole way up. Whereas if you just go and try and go straight, you all tend to do that, which means that you know, not only are you not covered to your final form parry, but there's also a chance that you might actually scoop the opponent's cut into you. Whereas if I do this, you can see that my blade is always moving and getting progressively more coverage as I get to the position. Um, which means that if you know, there are times when you probably throw a very fast attack, and you might form a bad parry that still saves you, because you've got a little bit of coverage and it's just enough. So I circle my tip out, turn my hand over, and come and sit with it just on, or um, well, I guess what you turn inside of my body. But, you know, um, basically, more terminology, hurrah, 
Um, if I think it's centerline, anything that comes on my sword side, so if it comes over from over here, is coming to my outside, anything that comes to here is coming to my inside. The reason being, basically the reason being is that shockingly, my arms are on either side of my body, so there is actually a big difference in how much target and also the mechanics of um, things coming from one side and the other. So with the prime parry, parry quantity. To share it from the side, I want my tip out, I don't want it out like this, to some extent, this is not a hanging guard. It's still down, it's about, it's out at what, like 45 degrees, and it's forward at 45 degrees. Um, and the reason I want, I don't want it flat, I want that. The reason I want that is if something hits, anything hits is going to stick, it's going to collide, and if it hits really anywhere above the bottom of my blade, it's going to blast straight through because of the leverage. If, on the other hand, my sword is out, anything hits is going to glance off, it's going to you know, the direct, you know, the force of the blow coming in is my sword, it's going to glide up and crash into my, um, my shell, to my handguard, where I've got the most damage. And I can do this at various heights. So, you know, there's obviously the prime parry, there's high prime, I'm looking at my hand under my sword, and there's low prime, which I used to defend leg cut. And the difference between these is just how much I rotate my shoulder. So, really, I think that, I tend to think of them as just the one of Harry. Um, some authors talk about high, high, and low, and medium prime, or just high and low prime. I'm like, it's just a prime pair at different heights because there's not the actual way you form the motion is the same, and you know, you just you want to learn to be dynamic and adjust it. So let's try a few of those out. So, prime parry. Back to guard, prime parry, 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 prime parry, back to guard, prime parry, back to guard. Prime parry and back to back. Alright, so before we move on, I'm just going to make sure there's no questions. Um, if you do have a question, just chuck it in the chat or in the comments, what, whatever's coming up for you. Um, and yeah, just um, you know, really just go over and I'll get to it um, between the weeks. Alright, so now let's look at reposts. So, um, Let's say for sake of argument, I've come to a nice medium prime parry. I've parried my opponent, so it'll be sitting about here. The best, one of the advantages of this parry is I can keep control and keep contact with my opponent's sword and come back at them on a fairly open angle by coming into, by doing a nice cut number two. Um, unlike, you know, if I parry with a cut parry, or court, and come back with cut number seven, or even a cut number two, depending on my preference, we're very, very closely connected. Whereas if I've got, whereas if I parry here, I could got a lot. My still, I've got a lot of movement or a lot of space to maneuver my tip to come back. So I can come back all the way with cut number two, or and come back with a cut number six. And depending on what my opponent's doing and their height, I've got a reasonable chance of hitting them. So we can all. Uh, why the circle before the prime parry? Wouldn't you just drop the tip and move to your left? Um, the reason the circle is because it, I find it gets you moving with the correct mechanics. I circle out because drawing this means that I'm coming to base. I'm getting to here very quickly and moving to a defensive position really quickly as well. Whereas I find, I mean, you can and you know just turn your hand over and flip over. But I find getting people to do that, understand the fineness of that movement is very difficult. Um, and what they tend to do is this, where rather than flicking over to the position, what they tend to do is loop to the position. And looping to the position means you're basically uncovered against the attack until you get to the prime carry position. Um, 
where he's doing this. I'm, I've got some protection from that here onwards. I draw a circle and turn my hand over. I've got some protection. My protect, level of protection increases until I get to the power position. Where he's doing this, I've got no protection until about here, which is like what a few centimeters before the positions are done. So just that little cue of that circle makes the parry a lot smoother and gives you a lot more coverage. Act. So let's look at some reposts. So I've done a little circle, I've come to my current parry, and now from here, all I'm going to do, which is from the side, is rotate my tip up to the cut number two position and whip it down. Rotate it up to the cut number two position and whip it down. Uh, when you practice this, you can do, you know, lunging is optional, but if you work, but I do encourage it. So, you know, you don't have to, but it's a, it's a good idea if you want to practice that. So from here, all we're going to do is go prime and cut number two. And come back to your heart. You can actually just do this where you come back to a prime position. Um, or you can have your tip mark standing kind of like normal hanging guard, which is just prime guard um, as well. But I'm going to go back to a medium just to practice going between positions. So, prime, cut number two. 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 Prime and cut number two. So I find that um, throwing cut number two is good if your opponent is taller than you. So if Jacob's watching and Jacob's fencing me next, um, Jacob being a bit shorter than me, pair and prime and throwing cut number two, a good option because my sword is low and it means that he's, it means whoever's, um, you know, whoever's got contact, um, whoever's got contact can basically come up the top and push down. So if I'm fencing someone, if I throw an attack and someone um, parries with prime and comes over the top, my swords can get pushed downwards as they come in, which makes it a little bit hard for me to parry. Conversely, if you're me, and Tim height, and tall, and you're often facing people who are shorter than you, you actually want to come, you actually want to come in, um, you may actually want to come in over the top of the parry, especially if they try to recover high, um, because I know a lot of short people will take advantage of the fact that they're quite short, by just doing a head guard to cover against everything. So from here, what I'm going to do is cut is um, return with a cut of six. So I'm going to prime parry, and then I come to this position, I can step my hand down and come with a cut of six. This is quite quick. Do you really good? So I'll show you that from the side, prime, and then snap down with a cut of six. So I can go. Prime, cut six, and then go. So let's practice that a few times. Prime, cut six, medium guard. 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 Act. So those are prime parries and just a simple repost you can do. Um, like two simple reposts, which are my favorites. Uh, although I do recommend again, like experiment with what you can throw. Uh, especially with the auxiliary parries where you're not necessarily you're generally not mimicking the hand position of, the, of your attacker. You've actually got a lot more options out in your pot. So what I mean by that is if someone comes in with a cut number one and I parry with cut, our hands are in the same position and I can't throw a cut number one back at them. Um, at least not without dislodging their cut first. Whereas if I throw the prime, from here, I can come around and throw a cut number one back at them because my hands are in a different position and all of me. What it will mean is I'm going to probably be throwing an absence, um, I don't want to have opposition, but I can throw really unexpected angles because of that. So another thing of these auxiliary parries is they kind of bend the rules of parry possible. 
ask you a question? Oh, Nick wants, um, Nick wants to know when to stop Zoom, because Nick's running a Zoom session afterwards. Um, set up maybe for, uh, let's go for 9.30, because I know we'll definitely be done by then. Um, but yeah, you might, you could always try starting a little bit earlier. Um, if, a little bit earlier, if you're, um, yeah, um, if we finish a little bit before that. All right, so let's look at the second pair we looked at tonight, which is the pair of seconds. I know we looked at it the other week, but I kind of want to revisit it just because it's fun. So, obviously, there is you know, the low second is a very standard parry, but you can also do it higher. Um, I don't recommend it for um, shots that come, are coming in at, say, your head height, just because you can, it's very hard to get proper leverage and you can still get clipped in the arm. Uh, it can work. Um, you can you know, change your, you can actually change the angle by leaning in, and that does work. It's kind of um, it can surprise your opponent. But anything that's coming from like sort of you know basically shoulder height downwards, you can defend with second at various height. So to make Paris second, all we do is circle our tip, we circle our tip uh, away, and then come back. So same idea, I'm circling away and coming back. And then I'm coming, and you see how my hand and my sword are all on my sword side. My tip is forward at 45 degrees. And in this case, my arm is straight because this is kind of the highest to have a second. Um, but you know, that's all perfect. Yeah, you know, that's all perfectly good. Act. So from here, let's go. So let's practice that a few times. Circle out, tip forward at 45 degrees, and second. Alright, so now let's look at some of the pack the boss you can do from there, because you know, where's the fun parry if you can't have a boss? So from here, I mean You've got a very, very sneaky return when you just turn your hand over and come up with cut number three. And I'm kind of fond of that, especially um, especially if you come to this position, usually that um, keeps, that actually comes up in a way that's very, very hard to parry. But you also gain protection, so if I can keep my opponent's block, if I come up on the opponent's blade while I'm sliding up, they would have, they're going to have to lift their blade up to actually be able to hit me. So they swing straight towards me, they're going to hit the side of my shell. Whereas if they lift their blade up, um, if they like, you know, fully try and pull their blade free to take advantage of that, then I'm in a very, very slightly formed opposition. I can just step backwards and take their arm instead of the body. So I have options. Right, so from here, second, hand over, and three. Second, 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 and three. Okay. So one of my other options for this, depending on what my opponent does, um, so I don't always necessarily need opposition or repost. For an opening attack, um, generally, you, want, you nearly always want a position because it's just too risky otherwise. But if, let's say, I've been playing the parry repost with my opponent, um, they've parry reposted, let's say, just twice. I can say with a pretty degree of certainty they're not going to throw. They're not going to throw a remix. They're not going to just attack again. Um, they're you know definitely covering themselves um, because yeah, like people you know. People who do very remissy fencing tend to do it all the time, whereas people who do paraplos will do most of that and occasionally throw remisses. Although, I don't think I've ever seen someone throw a remiss that wasn't off an initial lunge. I've never seen someone, like, you know, paraplos and then counter a the remiss. A remiss is when you throw two attacks on the same lunge. Um, it's generally considered bad fencing because your chances of covering yourself are very, very slim. You've got a very high chance of being. Um, and assuming and 
it's very, very easy to teach someone to be able to deal with your misses. Um, it's much easier to teach someone to deal with your misses than to do them, and to do them you really have to feel your own boundary for them what they're doing. Right. So from here, let's say I've got parried, my opponent saw this low, I'm relatively sure that they're going to recover. So what I'm going to do is sweep up and throw a cut number two. So a lot of people will actually recover to like hang out or prime guard in here. Um, it's very natural from once they've been parried to recover the prime. And so what I'm doing is sweeping up and I'm hitting them on the outside arm, just on the high out, like the high outside, because that can be very hard to cover. So second, cut two. 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 And second, cut two. Right. So I'm just going to quickly check for questions and grab a quick water. So that moves, us for, that moves us through to the parry of Quint. Um, Quint is being five. Uh, this is not, this is a hand position for foil. It's very rarely explicitly mentioned in Saber. Originally I wasn't going to include it, except um, because it's not a very, very useful position in Saber. There's actually Saber systems that use, uh, French Saber systems that use none of parries, where in those systems, Quint is the head guard. But the reason I want to include it is because I do use this parry occasionally against thrusts. Um, and it's also a position that you will move through. Uh, so when you're doing a transport, when you're moving your opponent's blade, you might parry and then move to another position. Or you know, parry and move to another position before throwing your pot because that will create an opening. So you're taking a little bit of extra time to force your opponent to take a lot of extra time to actually um, cover themselves again. If you're doing um, what's called transport or um, press defer, sentiment defer. Right, so Quint is my hand, is in this plane, same plane as it is for Tears, except rather than being on my outside, it's on the inside. So if you can see that, I've just moved my hand over to be in line with the offside of my body. And my tip is well out here. This is not this is not a good pair against a cut because my sword is like well over here. It is however good against thrusts because if I'm in a medium guard and I go to quint, I've now guided my opponent's sword off to a very, very large margin, and my tip is very, very wide, which means that I've got um, this huge I've got this huge opening to cover when I come back. So all you do for quint, hand over to side. Quint. 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 And quint. Alright. So because this is a position that we only really go to to create a lot of space, the only time the only repost I've ever thrown from here is always a very, very quick um, I think it was number seven. Some people might say this is actually number two, um, but I find that from here, rotating my hand actually gives my tip a lot more acceleration of how, and I'm not terribly worried about um, when my blade is to cover myself with my blade, because my blade is already super wide on my opponent, and I would only do this if my opponent is so wide that they're not going to be able to, they're going to, need to recover before they press their teeth. I'm keeping my hand centered though, so sometimes I will ride, like my shell, I will keep contact with my shell, the shell of my sword, as I ride back in. But mostly it's a case of I go quint and then throw a seven. So quint, seven. 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 Quint. 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 Seven.
7. Quint 7. And quint 7. Alright. Just going to double check. If you, like I said, if you do have any questions, just chuck them in the chat. Oh, it gets called five, that occasionally gets called five, but in the bridge systems it usually has a different name, and that is the head guard. Um, although in early 19th century bridge fencing, it's guard number seven because um, in like early in early 19th century and early to mid 19th century, the British uh, British saber and cutlass has one uh, hand has one hand position system, which is one. I'm sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven, and then the, the parries correspond to cut, uh, which cut their parry. So parry one deals with cut one, parry two deals with cut two, parry three deals with cut three, parry four deals with cut four, uh, parry five deals with cut five, parry six deals with cut six, and then parry seven deals with cut seven. Um, and then during as the 19th century goes on, um, to more elegantly describe the hand positions of parries, British, set, uh, British fencing masters started using the French numbering for parries, but because this numbering is, doesn't really work for cuts at all, it really, really doesn't work for cuts, they still keep the traditional British cut, um, cutting, cut numbering, um, which is a little confusing, was very confusing for me so. Alright, so anyway, we'll look at the head guard. So head guard, all I do, is I flick my hand up, I bend my elbow to a little above 90 degrees, I'm holding, I want to have my, uh, my upper arm at about horizontal, and the sword I want to have in front of me, but also uh, roughly level with my head. I don't want to have it really, really high once my opponent can slip it underneath. For two, it means I'm spending a lot of time coming back. I obviously don't want to have it too low because so my opponent might come in and wipe me over the top. If I find if I have it level with my head, because of, because my front sword is, because my sword is forward, my opponent's sword is always going to form an angle, and so I um, and so I will definitely be safe if I have this kind of my head height. So let's look for them again. All I do is turn my hand over and and raise the shoulder. Hand over and raise the shoulder. Hand over and raise the shoulder. Hand over and raise the shoulder. And head guard. Head guard. Head guard. And head guard. So this parry is a really, really good oh shit parry. Um, it's not necessarily a good guard to fall as um, you know as a basic defense, particularly a defense against an opening, because it's a lot, it's a lot more easily deceived. Than um, some of the other guard, some of the other guards against a direct, like a directly vertical cut. So you know, I, against a vertical cut, I'll probably use a high cart or a high tears if it's as an opener. But if I've got, a, if an opponent has, if I've thrown an attack, and my opponent has come in over the top, um, a really good cut. This is a really good oh shit parry. Um, yeah, because you can get to it very very quickly for most hand positions, and it covers the. It, kind of covers the entire high line, um, so anything that comes in high and very narrow, you're going to pick up. Um, also, if you're shorter than your opponent by, you know, like a head or so, like, you know, distinctly shorter, um, and, or alternatively you're just good at squatting, you can actually use this, you can actually come in under the cover of a head guard, and because everything will be coming from high, it's going to pick up everything. So it is a kind of, it's a useful kind of, if you've got, if you've managed your levels, in like boxing speak, yeah, your levels managed, um, you can actually use it as kind of a um, def, you know, kind of a universal parry against any high attack. Um, and the reason why you know, level management is important is if I'm a lot lower than my opponent, any attack, any quick attack is going to be a high attack, and any attack that is not a high attack is going to need to be or it's going to need to be prepared and move it around, so I'm going to be able to see it coming. So we quick. 
Um, Carter is head guard equals St. George. Yes, uh, the head guard is also called St. George. Uh, Hutton actually uses the term St. George because he likes using more terms. Um, it's called St. George in a lot of older manuals, and the head guard in later manuals. Why it's called St. George, I have no idea. Um, there is a, I don't know, I don't know if you call it a theory, but like a, like a hypothesis. The reason it's called St. George is when you parry something comes in, it forms a cross, and so St. George's cross, but, you know, who knows. Um, but yeah, so from here, when I do this parry, I've got some really good reposting options. I can throw very quickly, I can throw very, very quick, um, cat number two, so just from here, punch out and throw cat number two, which is pretty cool. So, head guard, two. 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 Head back to guard. My other option, which is quite cool, is I can do a head guard, and I can bring my sword all the way around, so I'm basically flicking my hand across to so this position, it's kind of um, High cart position and punching out to make a cut, throw a cut number one. And the advantage of this is because my blade is traversing around um, and throwing, I can actually use this to play, displace with my sword. So if I parry, I form a nice head guard, I say George, turn my hand over, and that means it's going to flip my opponent's sword somewhere out over there, which gives me a bit more time to land my attack and a bit of a better angle. So I parry. Hand over and cut number one. Parry, cut number one. Parry, cut number one. Parry, cut number one. Parry, cut number one. And parry, cut number one. So, yeah, those are my two kind of, all the two really quick, good options from a St. George guard or head guard, which I'm quite fond of. Right, so, I'm just going to have a check for a quick look for if there's any questions. Which there is not, which is looking good. Alright, cool. Alright, so let's move on and look at what's next. Uh, next, we're going to look at Paris 6. So you notice these are now. The Paris 6 is, if you might. Is if you imagine that you're in cart and you're like, hmm, I want my hand on the other side of my body, now you form six. So my hand is in this angle, it's in this alignment, but it's in line with the outside of my body, and I'm keeping my I'm keeping my blade. I probably actually want my blade in line with the edge of my body. I don't necessarily want the center line, I want a bit of an angle, um, but not much more. And the other way this parry is different to or the other parry we've got is it's a lot flatter. It's not a high parry like this because I find with enough um, the advantage of this parry is the advantage of this parry is that it's very narrow and it kind of catches things that come in and make them slide down to the end. It's kind of like the inverse of wind, but it's a bit more useful I find. Um, I also find it's really really good for a shit parry, so if I come to the cart and realize that my hands are faint, I just jerk my hand back there to line back on the side. So I'm here to get to the position six. Draw a little circle and come up. 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 Um, and the little circle actually has two advantages here. It's not just about stopping me from um, you know, overcarrying, especially because overcarrying with this is, is actually a lot more difficult than using some of the other parrots where I'm advocating the circle. But what it also means is that I scoop anything up. Um, and I find, you know, I find this almost like, I think in foil it's actually technically counter six. You know, you go directly to six, whereas you're doing a little circle, um, just kind of scoops up any parries or any kind of thrusts coming in. So if you get some, if you get some, like a foil fencer or a small floor fencer, um, you've got, you know, it, it kind of just eliminates any kind of deceptive play. Scoop and six. Scoop and six. Scoop and six. All right. And so from here, I find 
but you have two really good options from hosts. One is cut number one, because um, usually the angle created means that I can just, I've got my tip, my tip is up, it's quite clear of my opponent's sword, and as long as I throw quick enough um, to get the leverage, I can just ride this sword down back up. So six, cut one position, throw up. This is a very, very quick parry, or very, very quick repost. So six, one. Six, cut 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 one. That's a very good kind of quick parry. Um, double so, and it's something you want because six is a very is a very difficult parry to get sometimes. Like you have to be very precise to get it to land. So most of the time when you do it, it's to lot, it's either as an ocean parry or as a I know exactly where my current sword is going to be. I'm going to parry them with six, so they've then got so that my blade or my tip is really really far away from their sword, and I can just ride this sword back in. And The other option from here, other I mean, obviously you can throw a cut number two, but um, that can be quite nice. But the other option I find is really good is actually throw a cut number three. So six, three, six, three, six, three, six, three, six, three. And what that does is I parry, and then as I go through my three, I actually push my opponent's sword down. Um, and if they reflexively try to pull their sword out, they can actually fling my sword into their face as I throw my own switch. I just think it's kind of nifty, I like. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's power of six. Alright. So let's move on, and let's look at that parry on the seven So I think last week we looked at low set team. Or anything low, but I can also do it high. I find high set team you don't do. It's very weird to do high set team as, um, you know, as kind of, or as a primary carry. You don't do that very often unless it's kind of you're in a weird position. But I find the times where I tend to do it is I'll have parried tears, and I'll move to set the parry set team before throwing my repulse as a way of transporting disorientating my opponent. So kind of like Quint, um, you know, it's a hand position I want to know and parry I want to know uh, for either very rare situations or for um, as a way of discombobulating my opponent. I'm going to parry times 17 and then you know I've got an opening to throw a different attack or I've got a way of kind of even just disordering my opponent and um, opening up for something further than the track. So to get to 17, to a circle with my tip, come out and come to this position where my hand is in this angle. My tip is on the same side of my body as my hand, maybe on the centre line, maybe not. Um, yeah, it's approximate. It's fairly forward, um, and it's a fairly hot. It's, Compared to most parries, it's not like it's not this kind of 45 degrees angle we're normally carrying on. It's not quite horizontal, but it's a lot more tip forward than you'd expect. Um, and yeah, and the other thing is to get to the position, I'm mostly lifting my elbow. I'm not I don't want to do this where I'm contracting my elbow to um, contracting my elbow and making it a very small angle. I'm lifting from the shoulder. Using my shoulder to so yeah, prep and set to guard, 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 set and set to guard. Right. So I mentioned before that you can use this to open a repost. And I do have a favourite post I do from here. If I find my, if I've transported this position, um, particularly because my opponent's usually going to be quite wide at this point, so they're going to need a big movement to get um, to get out. All I do is turn my hand over and come across with a cut number six to 
somewhere between the nipples and the belt line. So, so team, cut six, 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 and so team, cut six. Right. So, that's a team that goes on to our last period for the evening um, because that's, that's at least as high as I can count in fencing, um, which is octave. So octave, my hand is over like this, same, same angle as a team, except it's on the sword side of the bottom. So I come to here. So you've got low octave, which is parry you can use your low cuts, and then there's high octave, which you're going to use a lot more. I find sometimes you will collapse your hand in, so you're looking at your hand under, but a lot of the time you actually want your hand more under. Hutton does say this is a very, this kind of parry is, it's popular with uh, cavalry, um, not so much with infantry, actually, he, as far as Hutton says that technically, all the, technically this is, he considers this an Italian parry, because the only place he's really seen it in this hand position in Sabre is in Italian Sabre. Uh, but the reason I think he, like the reason it's very much a cavalry parry, is if I'm doing this, I'm not, my swords are very much in front of me, but if my opponent is over here, it's like next to me, um, you know, the way that with horse, when you're fighting on horseback, your opponent is not directly in front of you, your opponent is to one side. Um, parry repost is very quick and very good, uh, and particularly in the 19th century, there wasn't a lot of cavalry melee. It's cavalry, cavalry engagements were typically done run, you run past each other and sort of slash each other. So this is a, um, and actually the final cavalry manuals that were produced in the English speaking world, um, you know, the ones that favoured uh, favored thrusting swords, part of why they went to things like the 1908 um, cavalry saber, was because what they were looking to do was, parry, was um, defend and attack in a single motion, a single time defence, um, because they figured that, or well, the thought, the feeling was that if you're engaging on horseback, you're going to be doing it whilst running on the run, um, on the gallop, basically, um, so that you'd be at full speed, but you'd be at full speed, you would not really have time to do one thing. Thanks. So, question the difference between octave um, and the one with chord on the right side? So, um, chord on the right of six. The difference between octave and six is in six your tip is up, octave your tip is down. Um, so yeah, that's actually a good way to think of it is. Um, octave is just six with the tip down, or six is octave with the tip up. One, two. Uh, also with octave, the elbow is more extended. In six, um, I generally keep my, I don't need to move my elbow because my hands are at um, very much, my hands are at the right elevation. With octave, I need to move my hand up, so my elbow is a lot higher. Six, octave. Right. So, pair of octave, um, all I do is I drop my tip and lift my hand. Drop tip, lift hand. Drop tip, lift hand. Drop tip, lift hand. Drop tip, lift hand. Pair of octave. High octave, high octave, high octave. You notice as well I'm actually loosening my grip a bit to get this. I, mean, I can almost, if I go like a, um, a heavy saber grip, um, hold on to the hot slot grip, I can, it high breaks down my, if I have breaks my wrist, I can do it with a light grip, but I also don't like high breaks my wrist, so I'm not going to do that. You can just hold loose, because a lot of the point of this is, um, this isn't an attack, a defense you use against a primary attack, it's one thing you use against a repost. So if this my favorite power repost combination, which is cart high six. I love it because it's really difficult to deal with. The only power that reliably defends it is high octave. I will probably regret telling you on that now. But the point is, I've got such strong leverage, and this, you know, that anything's gonna hit, any, I only use this when I know it, the opponent's sword is going to hit right up here, I've got such strong leverage that even if my sword is hit, it is displaced. It's going to displace this one, which is going to knock my opponent's sword up 
and over here, if they don't mind. So yeah, tough. Yeah, tough. And the other thing you'll notice about this is my hand, my tip is going in a circle, I'm starting in one way as I do this. And you can just think of this as doing more than that as everybody. Uh, which is kind of the advantage of it because when I do um, when I do a more line counts on my body, I've got this very quick, very powerful response. So if I know my opponent is going to is going to attack um, at you know from like neck height up, if I know they're gonna be up here, like I know if you know with a cut most of the time I'd like a cut number two to the outside body. I expect it's going to, it's probably going to land anywhere between sort of here and here. Uh, whereas if I know it's going to come in high, I can safely parry lock tar and throw a very quick return. Bang. And the other thing is I don't need to stop. I don't actually need, once I get to here, once I get to here, because of the um, angle of my sword, I can just throw this almost as a single, as a single movement. I go tar, cut one. It's very quick and very brutal, which, if you're good at it, it is really effective. I used to have a student, William, who, um, I told him this was a, was a, a very much sometimes parry, sometimes food, and he decided to do it all the time, and he got very, very good, just going, bang, which was really devastating. Um, so yeah, it's, it can work. Alright, so let's try that out. So, parry cut one. Tarot, cut one. Tar, 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 cut one. And tar, cut one. So yeah, you can see how that might be favoured by cavalry who want to respond very, very quickly to your point. Right. So that was. Alright, so that's. Um, the less or the main lesson for tonight. I thought I'd open it out to questions. Uh, if anyone has anything that they want they want to ask. Before we move ask, or I can come up with some extra stuff. Um so yeah, are there any questions before we move on? It's looking like a no. Actually I do have something else to to mention, there, is other there are other types of parries that you see that are kind of cool, and these are circular parries. So I'll do this with a stick, just most of it's easy with a stick. Good question. I'll mix it up. Tar feels very odd. It does. Um, Parry of tar, doing it, practicing this movement, is very much a, um, is very much a, um, an exercise in most mobility. Right. So the other parries that you can do are circle parries. Um, so you sort of a little bit, a little bit with um, six, where uh, to come to the position, I actually throw a circle, and that guy, and anything that means anything that's coming in in front of me, like or a thrust, any thrust coming in front, um, in front of me, um, will be put up. I don't, you don't tend to do that a lot necessarily um, because, you know, um, people don't tend to thrust a lot with the saber. So if you've got an opponent who's thrusting with the saber, um, you know, sort of thrust a saber fencer, then good thing to do. If you've got someone also if you're fencing against a small sword um, or an epee, it's a good thing to do or it's a useful thing to do, except that, you know, I find when you're facing an epee, if you just cut X's at them um, and move in, it tends to shut down a lot of what the opponent might do anyway. So, um, swings and roundabouts like this. Alright, so, um, but circle parries, if I want to parry, let's say I want to parry tears, but I'm not too confident I know what my opponent's sword's going to be, like they're a bit deceptive, I might do a circle and come to tears. And what that means is that when I come to tears, my sword is coming from down here, which means it's whipping across my body. Um, when you're drawing a circle, don't think of it as a circle in front of you. Think of it as a circle um, at sort of this angle, this angle here. I'm drawing this kind of circle. Um, and I, I find the reason to do that is it means that 
as I'm coming in, um, as I'm coming in, I'm coming forward. There's never a point where I'm dragging my opponent sort of across my body. Um, I'm always displacing a little bit because at this point I'm sort of here. Because I've got, um, because of the angle of my sword, I'm essentially shearing my opponent's sword and coming in straight down the line with it, which pushes it off sideways, which is a bit hard to show that sword. But if you imagine, um, you know, if you imagine my hand, if I just place my hand a little bit, I just give a little push that way and then come forward. Um, changing the leverage means I get the, my hand moves further out, um, even though the stick is just coming forward and shearing down it. So from here, from medium, draw the circle and come to tears. 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 I can actually do this on the other side. Um, this again, this is a way of kind of. So it's a semi-universal parry. It's a parry that covers all. I sacrifice parry speed to increase coverage and help me get around feints. Um, especially because of very, very popular feints that people throw, is I'll go cut, like they'll do an angle cut and then come straight into the seven by just disengaging over your tip. Um, and so this is kind of useful for catching the wind that. The other option is. is a circular cut. So what I do is I dip my tip down and flip it back up. And again, I'm drawing, I'm not drawing a circle like A, I'm not drawing a circle vertically in front of me, I'm drawing it at a 45 degrees angle in front of me. So when I do this, it goes back and up, back and up, back and up, back and up. Back and up, back and up, back and up. This is really freaking awkward. But it has the same advantage, um, the same advantage where I can pick up things slightly more. And this can be quite a good thing to do if you're trying to throw a Also, if you're retreating, um, when you're retreating, you've got more time to throw. Um, you've got a bit more time to pick things up. This can kind of be a good one, you know, kind of be a good thing to parry slip and then come back and then come back and I've heard of, I've encountered a great many frustrating fences who basically parry circular everything going backwards um, because they um, circular because yeah it just picks up like it picks up any kind of deceptive attack all right um, cool so we finished a little bit earlier I think um, although Mick, Mick said he was going to launch a Zoom meeting. Um, so yeah, if, um, so yeah, Mick, if you can set that up and launch that now, we'll just um, and then just post it to the comments here into the event. Um, but other than that, um, I would like to remind everyone that we've got uh, workshops on every week. So I think next week we're doing thrusting, and I'll post details of that in um, the event, like details of that in the Facebook event for tonight. Uh, but you can also see it on the old sword club um the other thing as well is um we do have some running costs now because the streaming software we use does cost a little bit of money um but if you can like if you can spare some change um you know feel free to make a donation obviously these are going to like these um sessions are going to continue to be free for the duration of covid um and i'm hoping to keep them free once we're done um, but yeah, so there's, I've just posted uh, link, donation links, which I'll show on screen. Um, so yeah, um, if you can make a PayPal donation, that'd be greatly appreciated. Um, anyway, so I will hopefully see you all um, in a few minutes in, um, in a few minutes in um, mix, uh, mix Zoom session. But if not, um, hopefully I'll see you again, um, hopefully I'll see you again next week. Um, for this time thrusting with cutlers and yeah I um, hope you all have a wonderful night so, just flash uh, the zoom this is the address for the zoom meeting if people want to um, want to join in alright cool so
I will see you all tomorrow. So I hope you all have a good one.